Sammy so okay. Here we go. We're back. We are back. Are you surprised? We're back. Of course we're back. We, we live back. here. We live here. <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Here it is, the one o'clock block, uh, here on Think Tech on a Thursday afternoon. And we have a very, 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 very special guest here, Dr. Tun Bui. Uh, he is a professor and has been a professor for some time, the Matson professor at the Scheidler College of Business. Let me tell you his basic goals in life. He is the Matson Navigation Endowed Chair, Professor of Global Business, and he's the Chair of the Department of Information and Technology Management. He's Director of Pacific Research Institute for Information Systems Management and the Director of the Apex Study Center. We've been talking about that. He's the Director and uh, CEO of the UH Vietnam uh, Executive MBA programs in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. He's the chair of the Hawaii International Conference on System Science, hcss.org. And he's, uh, at, it's all at the Scheidler College of Business, University of Hawaii at Manoa. And I am so happy to have him here. Welcome to the show yet again. Wonderful to have you here, Tung Boy. Thank you, Jay, and thank you for having me back. So we're going to talk today <clears throat> about, um, you know, things that fall within your ambit. Uh, what's going on in business in, in, in Asia Pacific? What's going on with Trump and how Trump affects business through his diplomatic machinations and his business maneuvers where he steps on things? Um, and so I want to get a handle on the real effect of this, uh, and I know you can help me. You've, you've thought about this, and uh, I'd like to propose some propositions to you and see what you have to say about them. Um, these are very interesting. And you gave me these propositions, so I'm interested. <laughs> I try to do my best. <laughs> <These are> ob <laughs> observations, okay? <clears throat> First, um, let's see. First, Asian countries, and for that matter, most of the trade partners of the U.S. around the world are concerned about the isol isolationism of the U.S. administration. Uh, why are they concerned, and how deep a problem is U.S. isolationism? Okay, I think a major problem from the perspective of Asian countries is the fact that most Asian economies, they rely their growth on a export-driven economy. If you look at the past, Japan, China, South Korea, uh, and other countries, they rely so much on exporting their production to major economies, and in particular the United States, in order to grow the economy. And for the last decades or so, we have a, num a number of other tigers countries, like Vietnam, the Philippines, and Indonesia. And those countries actually are also trying to duplicate the, the same model. And now, with Trump's policy trying to reduce the trade deficit. Therefore, it's a major concern, and quite a few businesses in Asia are getting very anxious about looking at the U.S. as a limitation to export their products. Yeah. So can you uh, throw in the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the dichotomy between sales of goods and sales of services? Do we have an advantage in services uh, or an advantage of goods or both? And how does isolationism affect our ability to sell services and goods? Yes, and actually this is a great question that we need to think more deeply. Uh, the economy of today is not an economy of a producer and a buyer or a seller or a buyer. But basically, we are living in an economy where integration is so important, and then you are my buyer, but I am also your buyer as well. Let me give you an example. Mm. iPhone, for example, is buying technology from Samsung to produce its iPhone, and Samsung is buying technologies from Apple in order to build its uh, Samsung Galaxy. So you cannot say that the South Korea has a trade accident vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., but it's just it's, the accounting doesn't work anymore. So this is something that using the concept of trade deficit to engage in a trade war the, the doesn't seem to work anymore. Yeah, trade wars are old, old, old. Yeah, they're yeah. they're gone and forgotten. <clears throat> but let's take uh, the Asia Pacific region at least and uh, talk about how it has been, how it has been under Obama, how it has been in terms of developing robust relationships under the existing arrangements, including the TPP, which didn't didn't actually survive for us anyway. Uh, how has it been? Are we are we being successful these days? Are we doing the things we you know could have should have done? Before for Trump? Uh, let me talk about two things, the reality of the economy and the politics of it. 
uh, the reality of the economy is that the world is now living in the context of its of the international supply chain network. So we buy a lot of, we Americans, we buy a lot of stuff from Asia in order to produce our stuff. For example, China has been known to be the factory of American companies, sure. Walmart and Apple and so on. And Vietnam is now uh, catching up as well. Most of, interestingly enough, if, when people think about Vietnam, they think about exporting rice or fish or all these things. But oh. in fact, the major bulk of export from Vietnam actually are high-tech products made for by American companies. Yeah, how about Chinese companies? Chinese companies are outsourcing to Vietnam too? Uh, a little bit, uh, but not as much, uh, because they are still competitors between them as yes. a uh, producers of uh, basic parts. Mm -hmm. But then, so if you look at Vietnam, which is currently in the blacklist of uh, the Trump administration as one of those 20 countries that cause trade deficit to the U.S., but in fact, these countries are supporting the production of American products. So the supply chain context is much more complicated than just looking, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, the relationship between the borders of two economies. There is not such a thing anymore in this context. Now let me talk a little bit about the TPP. Uh, by withdrawing from TPP, I think we are basically denying our opportunity. To me, I think it is an opportunity loss. Uh, just last month in Hanoi, there was a TPP meeting of 11 countries without the U.S. Not there at all. Not there at all. And they were discussing about what to do without the U.S. And now Japan has decided to take the lead uh, to, replace, to replace the United States. And there is another thing that is going on right now, the regional comprehensive partnership between China and other Asian countries. And now China is, take, is trying to take the lead on that issue. And now they are also developing the Silk Road to do business yeah. with Europe. Yes. So certainly in the international business, if you try to disappear, then it doesn't work. So I, my understanding <laughs> from the Trump administration is that they would like to get rid of collective bargaining but engage into a bilateral negotiation. So instead of going through TPP, instead of going through WTO, what they would like to do is they like to go one by one. But one by one favors the larger partner. And if you want to try to dominate, you can dominate better in a one in a one on one unilateral agreement. No? So I guess this is a point. The point is that because of the fact that the US is still the number one economy in the world, and by getting into a bilateral negotiation, for example, U.S., Vietnam, U.S., South Korea, U.S., Japan, and so on, the law of the jungle is that the stronger would prevail. But the problem is this is a fully globally integrated world. You cannot just engage into a bilateral negotiation because what happens if I negotiate with Japan and Japan negotiate with China and China negotiate with Vietnam, Vietnam with the Philippines, and so on? You, you end up to have a big mess. And this is why WTO and TPP are set there for that matter. Yeah, that's so interesting. So <clears throat> where in the past, uh, I think this kind of arrangement was largely unilateral, or bilateral, I should say. Um, you try that today and you run into trouble. And, I, and it sounds like that's this administration's strategy, to go from multilateral to uh, bilateral and then have separate agreements on the thought that, they'll, that the administration will be more powerful with anybody on a one-to-one -one basis than on a one-to-many basis. But the problem, and I'd like to identify the problem, so let's assume we try to do that. Let's assume we try to have a multi, I mean, bilateral agreements with all the countries in the world, a couple of hundred countries. Um, what happens? You said it unravels, but how does it unravel? How does it, how does it come back to bite us? So you know, bilateral uh, negotiation would, might work if you were in business. So assuming you produce, um, let's say, computers, and then you are trying to negotiate between different suppliers, like memory chips, for example, then you can play that game a little bit. So you, you negotiate with one guy, and you try to counter offer with another guy. It might work as a business. But this is a government, and government do not have full control on 
international businesses. You are talking about multinationals. You are talking about global firms. You are talking about individual businesses around the around the world. Uh, they are so creative. This is the essence <laughs> of entrepreneurship. They don't care. They don't care, precisely. <laughs> they don't care. And they will find a way to circumvent that situation. And therefore, I don't think the concept is going to work. My, my view of the government, especially the leadership of the U.S., is to set a fundamentals of doing global business, standards, uh, human rights, uh, labor law, uh, fair trade, so that we can have a fair playground for businesses to run, to do international competition and competitiveness. And this is not the matter of saying that uh, you have a trade deficit against me, then I'm going to kill you. And it's not going to work. And this is this is a second observation that I would like to share with you a little bit. Asia is trying to figure out how to counteract with the new administration in Washington, D.C. So the easiest policy is to do wait and see. And I think this is actually a fairly fair strategy because, honestly, we still do not know yet what Washington, D.C. is thinking nowadays. Yeah. Uh, second, so you have got to figure out if they have a consistent policy to do anything about global trade. But one thing that is so stunning to me is the outcome of the negotiation between uh, President Trump and China. Before President Xi came to Washington, D.C., he really threatened China quite a bit about the trade deficit, about currency depreciation, and so on. But then, after a few days of meeting, basically, he forgot about all of these things, and he even gave quite a bit of trade concessions <laughs> for the sake of security against North Korea. Right. <laughs> so what is the point? So certainly, what, what it means is that starting from a very simplistic view of business, looking at reducing trade, bar, uh, uh, trade deficits and getting more jobs to the U.S., now we are putting a lot of factors that were not considered at the very beginning. Yeah. So basically, my strategy that I would think Asian countries would be doing is that they would create all kind of possibly artificial arguments in order to counter the benefit of trade deficits against the USA. <laughs> this is, it sounds fairly tumultuous, and it must be a real tra strain on the, the, the people, the rank and file in the State Department, the State Department officials, and as far as the, as you said, if, as the multinational corporations are concerned, they probably say, okay, do whatever you want, we're going to handle it on a business basis by ourselves. So, so this is precisely the point that I'm thinking, uh, because the, the, the new administration in, in Washington is relatively new, uh, it's only like more than four months, so people are still trying to figure out what is happening there. But at the end of the day, I would argue that the impact from the Trump policy would be much smaller than we expect. Uh, there could be a lot of noise that would obviously cause a lot of concern and anxiety it has been, yeah. but at the end of the day, the force of integration, globalization, the impact by those uh, multinationals, those global companies, the flow of money, the flow of ideas, the flow of people to support the sustainable economy is going to prevail. <laughs> so uh, we might be we might have a lot of ink to talk about what is happening in the Trump administration, but I think at the end of the day, life would go on. <laughs> We're going to take a short break, Tung Boy. We're going to yeah. <laughs> kind of integrate what you're saying. It's really wonderful. And then we'll be right back. Thank Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. 
I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're here with Chung Boy, a professor, a Matson professor of global business and many other things at the Shredler College of Business. Uh, we have the honor of having him in, in the studio today to talk about uh, uh, Asia Pacific and business and all the things the Trump administration is doing and how that affects it and how it affects us, I guess, ultimately. But, you know, I, I wanted to uh, explore with you the, you know, the, the kind of policies that the Trump administration is putting out, the kind of isolationist policies. Uh, uh, trade war type of policies, um, bilateral instead of multilateral approach to things. Um, <clears throat> this is costing us in some way. It may not have as profound an effect on trade and business as we think, perhaps, um, because um, trade and business is conducted by business partners who may not care what the governments do at any given moment in time. I'm telling you that there was a Harvard professor of business out here a couple of years ago, and she pointed out that you you measure influence by the amount of money that passes hands, and the amount of money that passes hands between multinational corporations is far greater than between governments, and therefore, if you measure it that way, these businesses have greater influence than the governments do. Um, but I'm wondering about the geopolitical aspect and how that affects business, you know? It's, so you can say, well, it doesn't affect business that much, but we, we have to agree that when everyone in the world is ticked off at the U.S. for things that he's done and the isolationist positions that he's taken, um, that affects our image, our reputation, our influence nationally and geopolitically, but doesn't it ultimately also affect business? Well, uh, it certainly has an impact. I don't think we could deny it. Um, we, we have already seen a slight decrease in uh, people, tourists, visiting the USA. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have seen quite a few contracts being delayed because people like to see what is the impact on trade policies, on tax, on import tax, and so on. So uh, no denial, there is an impact. But again, as I mentioned, in a global economy with a global supply chain network, people are so creative. And then there are certain states in the U.S. who find way to who are finding ways to circumvent the policy in Washington D.C. At the end of the day, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we don't know yet the impact. But I hope and I suspect that the impact is not going to be that big at the end of the day. As far as the geopolitical situation, obviously you might have heard the tension between Mr. Trump and other leaders in the world, including the Prime Minister of England and then the new, newly elected uh, French president. But, uh, and then <laughs> Is there anybody who's not being disregarded And the story about the Chancellor of Germany. So, <laughs> right, right. So, so the story goes on and goes on and goes on. But I think people are smart. And in the world of diplomacy, at the end of the day, uh, people reason. And the language of um, the reason is going to prevail, I think. And the hope that we all have about our president is that at, he is finally a businessman at heart. And business people, successful business people, tend to be very pragmatic. And it, a pragmatic person tend to come down to reason. I think the real situation that we are having right now is that the view from the American administration is so simplistic, and the world is by far much more complicated than that simplistic view of the world. But then I think uh, the, work, the work goes on. And one message that I would like to share to the administration is that uh, if you go back to the wisdom by Aristotle, Aristotle. Yeah. You know, I want you to know on Think Tech, we, we, we spare no no possibility. We talk about Aristotle. Have you talked about Aristotle lately? Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> but, but this is actually common wisdom nowadays. The whole is actually much greater than the sum of its parts. So what it means is that we live in a global economy, then we have many individual nations that are working together. So we can come up with a global concept of working together to co-create value to all the citizens of the world. It is much better than isolating ourselves in our own corner of the world and try to do the best we can. 
So I don't think the model would work anymore. And this wisdom actually is more relevant today than ever. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what's interesting is that some of these leaders are much more Akamai than the, the Trump administration is Akamai about these things. Uh, they're, they're sophisticated. They understand. Uh, and I wonder, <clears throat> when you say that, uh, in, inherent in that is that, well, he may want to do a trade war, but people, I mean, leaders in other countries are not going to respond in kind. They're going to be more Akamai than that, because if they responded in kind, we'd have this. And Correct. as you said, trade wars are over. That's, that's, yeah. that's done and gone. Um, so how will they respond even if he becomes more isolationist and more, you know, multilateral, even unilateral, and engaged in trade war? Well, in the short term, I expect nothing is going to happen. Everything in the global world, especially from in terms of international negotiation, is moving extremely slow. So maybe when, maybe if Trump stays for the second term, these things might happen, but I don't think his ideas is going to be carried over immediately. And then in the second observation, which is actually the bit more scary to me, is that despite the fact that the U.S. is still the number one economy in the world, we are no longer the most important factor. Uh, the world actually technically uh, could go by without us. It, they need us. We are a very important country, for, especially for Asia. Yeah. But then, without us, they can, they can still survive. So basically, the message is that should we be part of it or be out of it? Yeah. But I think the world will move on. Yeah, like in TPP, other people will take our, our role. We will no longer be a leader in that. We and will no longer be a trade leader. And going back to the TPP, I think this is truly a opportunity loss. To me, the economy of the 21st century is moving, and it has already moved in, the service economy. And this is where the USA has a lot of uh, competitive advantage. You are talking about software technology, you are talking about tourism, you are talking about education, you are talking about healthcare. So we are leading the world in those areas, and then the whole world is looking up to us in order to do the leadership in international trade by withdrawing from those uh, partnerships because of the fact that we are losing in certain economic sectors like, like uh, production, uh, this, yeah. those technologies, and then, then we are trying to protect something that we are losing anyway, and we are foregoing opportunities on something that is much bigger, yeah. which is a service industry. Yeah, it's the wrong way to go. So what is the right way to go? I mean, for example, you know, if you had TPP, TPP is what, a dozen or so nations? Twelve. Uh, Twelve. Um, and, um, you know, uh, APEC, which is... Uh, Eleven, I'm sorry. Eleven, okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, APEC is like 21 nations and so forth, and uh, although APEC is not so much a trade agreement as a sort of broader economic kind of agreement, That's but <clears throat> I'm, I'm just wondering, what is the optimal solution? Because you can have 12, why not have 200? Why not have the model of TPP and APEC prevail for world relations, world trade, for everyone to be involved on an equal basis? Is, is that, does it reach a, a tipping point where it's no longer productive? Do you have to stay relatively small, or can you go global? Actually, the best of all words would be to keep working on the World Trade Organization, which is the largest body that embraces the most of the nations on Earth. The problem is that like a big family, if you have a big family, then you expect to have more internal fights. Yes. So have a smaller group of people, then it tends to be a little bit easier to manage. So actually, the concept of TPP is so wonderful because you are dealing with 12 countries, Yet they occupy 40% of the trade of the, uh, the of the GDP of the world and one third of global trade. And then the beauty about the TPP is that you are dealing with a strong economy, which is the US, and it's talked about other countries that are supporting American economies in the context of the supply chain economy. Uh, South Korea, Vietnam, the Philippines, Indonesia, all of these countries actually are our suppliers. And therefore, it is nice to work within that smaller set of family. Sure. 
It's a as practical to, thing. Exactly, as opposed to a, a WTO that is way too big. Yeah, so it's a, a matter of practical considerations for easy management. If you have a 200-member organization, it's Versus very hard health. to manage it, and, and people will be unruly and sometimes difficult. So it's better to have it small and let them ask to come in, mm -hmm. and then maybe we take them in. You could uh, be right. Shrinking this down to Hawaii, okay? It strikes me that there was a time, maybe there still is a time, when Hawaii can be a trade leader, uh, a place for mediation, a place, um, a sort of market center, if you will. And right now we have signs of that at the convention center with all these scientific conferences that are happening. It's, it's, right now there's one going on this week, 8,000 people coming in to talk about microwave technology. Uh, there was one not too long ago, there'll be a lot more in the future involving hundreds of thousands of people that come in and millions and millions even billions of dollars come in by way of tourism. Now, that in itself is not a big deal, except that it seems to me that Hawaii has a prospect as a state of the union to be a trade center. Do you agree, and do you think that the Trump administration is undermining that possibility? To my personal knowledge, I haven't seen anything happening yet. Again, I think uh, Hawaii is a little bit too small out the radar of what the Trump administration is thinking right now. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the world uh, goes on. So uh, tourism in Hawaii is still good and healthy because of the fact that we are still one of the best destinations in the world and given a more insecure world nowadays. Hawaii has been recognized as a safer place to travel and visit. And then thanks to the University of Hawaii, we do have, we do attract quite a bit of uh, scientific uh, conferences in the, con in the state. So I think uh, we are, at least for now, uh, still doing okay. And again, I don't think that what is happening in Washington DC would impact us too, too much. <laughs> uh, on, a bright, on a bright spot, uh, uh, the Trump administration is, increase, is increasing significantly the military budget mm. by a huge percentage. Mm, 54 billion or I something. Know. So if I think he can. If he can, yeah. of yesterday, and if he can, then I expect that it would benefit Hawaii a little bit as well. Mm, yeah. And one more thought before we close is that um, I understand in November of this year, uh, they'll have the APEC meeting in, um, in Vietnam. Vietnam. Correct. Uh, and Trump has said, and this is, seems counter to some of the other things he's done, Trump has said he's going to attend. Do you have any thoughts about why he's going to attend, what kind of a presence he's going to create there, and what kind of benefit, if at all, um, we will have, the United States will have from that? The benefit by APEC versus the major meetings like the Accord in Paris or the WTO meeting yeah. is that APEC is basically a non-binding meeting. So we, uh, participating countries don't have to sign anything, and therefore it is just a... <laughs> it's a hobby. A hobby, <laughs> a photo op oh, for people you. to light up and then talk, uh, take pictures and smile. <laughs> so I think... Uh, no interminable mid. I don't think he would miss that opportunity. It's perfect. That is perfect opportunity <laughs> for a photo op. Yeah. The better meetings are the ones where you actually get down to business, make deals, write it up, and yeah. you have all the necessary authorities back home actually approve it. Correct. But it's not going to happen there. So no, no. Thank you, Tung Boy. It's been great to talk to you. I know we have miles to go, and maybe we can do this again soon. Thank you for having me, and thank you again. Aloha.